Can you please make your way towards, uh, towards the front and uh, grab a seat? We are going to start the last session uh, of ADC 2019. Um, we, will, we will send you guys a survey uh, in the coming days, but um, I would like to see a show of hand if you think this venue should host ADC next year. Okay, it's very hard to know if it's a majority. So who would not like ADC to be here next year? Okay, so we do have a majority for people who would prefer it to be here. Okay, so thank you. We'll, we'll ask you that again after, so you, you can be anonymously responding. Uh, and, uh, and we'll probably send you dates as soon as, as we can for the next edition. Uh, so I, I have um, a few thank you uh, to, to communicate. Um, first to the team, the ADC team who's put up this event. So Joshua, Sophie, and all the volunteers. So please uh, join me. And uh, I wanted to say this in the, in the opening um, introduction, but uh, all the volunteers here are students from universities around here. They all, uh, well, in the process of finding a job at some point. Please, if you look for someone, an intern or someone who wants, uh, or if you have a job to fill at that sort of graduate level, uh, please go and talk to them. I'm sure they would love uh, a career proposition. Uh, I would like to thank also all the speakers. They did an amazing job. They make ADC, so please, uh, join me, thank you then. Also, uh, Ricardo, Andres, and the team who made the live stream happen, uh, please join me again, thanking them. Um, well, I I'm gonna stop there, but, um, Tonight we have two events. One is going to happen here, right after the last um, event, it was the last talk. Um, and there would be pizza served in the upper gallery and there would be a cash bar as well. The other event is happening in King's Cross. There's still some space available if you want to, if you are uh, in the process of creating a business, if you want to network with some of the uh, tech leaders that are, that are here as well and just or just see how a pitch is, is, is done uh, in, uh, in two minutes, like an elevator pitch. Uh, please come along. We'll have 10 uh, exciting startups who will, will do just that, pitch to, uh, for two minutes. This is going to be an interesting event. It's, it's across town, it's in King's Cross, so um, we'll start that event at seven, and not 7.30 as, as we uh, have indicated in an email earlier. So yeah, this is the last talk of ADC. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Gerhard Bellius, the founder uh, and CEO of Ableton, uh, to join me in a fireside chat. I think we'll actually have a, a fireside video showing up shortly <laughs> to bring you in the atmosphere of a, of a Swiss chalet. Um, we'll have some questions at the, t at the end if there's any, any um, uh, for you to, to ask. And uh, yeah, so I, I will not say anything else after the, after the, uh, the keynote, so this is my thank you to, to you. And please join me in welcoming uh, Gerhard Bellius. Hello Gerhard, how are you? Good to be, good to be here. Good to have you. Thank you so. for the prime spot. <laughs> here we go, we have uh, awesome. Welcome to our Swiss chalet. <laughs> How about a cigar? Um, so, um, welcome. It's, it's, it's fantastic to have uh, had you coming here and, and spend the last two days with us. Uh, I know that you're very busy, so I'm very um, humble that you took the time to check us out and um, so this year is particular for Ableton you've been in business for 20 years and uh, and a lot happened in 20 years live has become uh, one of the standard from uh, creating uh, uh, electronic music 
and um, I would love to for you to explain how that journey was for you and yeah. Well, first, uh, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to uh, be here and have this uh, special opportunity with you all. I'm a veteran, I guess, at this point, 20 years into it. Uh, I started uh, myself in a situation maybe not unlike a lot of you, as a programmer, as an audio fanatic. Uh, I uh, was very lucky to have had fantastic mentorship along the way in really great conditions uh, at an early time in the 90s when a lot of this stuff was not like as commonplace it is, as it is now. And uh, through especially uh, our own like musical practice uh, with my friends, we got to like this place of um, there's something missing that we need. It's like an entirely personal thing, like for the kind of music that we make and how we make it, you know, the tools that we have at our disposal are somehow not right. Now, because we were programmers, we could help ourselves out and uh, patch our own, max patches mostly, uh, but also then soon found that there's somehow interest and traction uh, for this thing that we're doing that's outside the scope, the narrow scope of our own like live shows and, and studio setups. So that then became the sort of starting point for we could you know, make something real out of this. And I think the 20 years is uh, interesting in maybe if I had to describe one motion uh, that characterized the time, it would be zooming out where, I mean, for myself in particular, the zooming in was intense. It was like code. You are concerned with every single line and that's what you do. And then, of course, you build a company, you build a product, it's for people other than you, so you zoom out a little bit, but you're still firmly within that screen, right? That's your world, those pixels, and the experiences that uh, are mediated by the mouse, that's all you got, that's all you spend your time thinking about. And it got us quite far down to live, I don't know, version something, when we somehow naturally uh, felt we need to break out of that frame and look at the person as not just a brain, but also like as a physical being who has, uh, you know, dexterity, has uh, means, means of expression uh, that uh, we also want to address. And that naturally got us into the field of making instruments, physical instruments. So we made a physical instrument, it's called PUSH, and that I think was like a big milestone for us. And then the zooming out goes on, like you zoom out further and you think of, well, okay, so now we see the whole person, but what beyond the moment that we tend to, the here and now, whether in the process of making the music, is that to be considered? How did they get there in the first place? Like, what's that journey looking like up to that point? What did they pick up? from who, how did they learn, how did, how did they acquire the skill, the knowledge, the competency that they can now use. And then that becomes part of the con concern too. And you start to think about learning a lot. And somehow we were very lucky all the time because around the Ableton brand and live, there was always a very vivid educational community with lots of teachers, private teachers, schools, that uh, used live and we had very privileged insight from that world too. So I guess then, you know, the zooming out goes, goes further, you zoom out more and you're like, so what about all the people that uh, we don't even see? Like the people that never make it into all of this. And it's somehow sad to think, like this, these incredible moments of happiness that we see happen and that we get like these, amazing responses from the community about how this has enriched their lives and how the experience of making music is like so fundamentally important to them and like really, I mean, that, that identity, that it makes you think, well, can't be that we exclude so many people and then that becomes a concern too. And now you're at a Zoom level where you're looking at kind of the world, I guess, and uh, you're looking at places 
that we don't even touch. At uh, entire communities that we're not addressing. Uh, I guess that's where we're at now. So these are the kinds of things that occupy me. Okay. Uh, and um, so um, 10 years ago about that, you, you launched uh, Push. And just to zoom back in for a minute uh, on, on the, uh, this transformational change for the company, going from being a, a software company to, uh, to being a software and a hardware company. How, how was that? How did that happen? And I mean, it happened quite naturally. And I, I want to say as gently as we could have hoped, because we had great help, great partners. We didn't jump right into it full on. We uh, had a series of uh, partnerships with uh, Novation and with Akai to build products together. And I mean, it kind of naturally evolved into a situation where we all agreed it makes sense for Ableton to take this on full on. At this point, you're ready, you can do it. And it wasn't quite that scary at that point because we were already exposed to a lot of the kinds of in and outs of doing hardware. I think nowadays, again, 10 years later, probably it's even less daunting than it was back then. This, this stuff is getting much, becoming much easier over time. So you make your product more complicated, I guess, to compensate. That's, of course, also what's happening. I mean, it continues. OK. Um, so from the outside uh, world, the, the Ableton seems to be a very focused company, having just one software and, and one hardware. Uh, so w what, is, um, what is Ableton's uh, mission? And you know, to, to, zoom, to zoom back, uh, to zoom out again, uh, looking at the next 20 years, what, uh, what, what does Ableton or you want to, uh, to achieve? OK, JB, so the problem is that if I talk about these internals, I get trouble at home. So <laughs> I, I suggest instead, maybe if you allow, we open the question up just a little bit and discuss like, what might that question, how might that question be answered if we take the whole room into consideration. So we as a niche industry, OK, so what might our next 20 years look like or what's important for us as a whole mm -hmm. community? Yep. I mean, maybe there's also more, more relevance in that discussion for, for everybody. And um, I mean, there's some, to get some basics sorted first, of course, we need to keep making amazing, rock solid tools for the trade. Like a musician needs to rely, stuff needs to work. It's important that you know, there's a peace of mind around using this gear. And I think there's also maybe another obvious uh, thing I would uh, put in that, uh, in that bucket around, we want to continue to make tools that inspire and provoke new art. So a person who's maybe advanced in the conception of what it is they want to do, how the artistic expression uh, is looking should be somehow tickled by what we make. No, like they should, there should be more than just the satisfaction of something that's already expected. There should be something that gets the person moving in a direction that wasn't per perhaps anticipated. I think often uh, people that interact with the tools that we make are looking for some kind of dialogue with the tool. So that's all that has to be. Uh, all that has to be progressed. And I mean, we've heard a whole bunch of stuff for the last two days that indicates fascinating directions for that. And I think then we can maybe go beyond the obvious and like so zoom out again to like, you know, as far as we get and, and ask some like really complicated question. I mean, it's still early, isn't it? So we could ask, if we think of the condition of the world as a whole and the kinds of massive challenges that we are facing as a, you know, as a species, how do, we, how do we relate to that? Like, I mean, everybody's asking themselves that on an individual basis. And I think uh, companies should ask themselves that question and industries should ask them that question. And I mean, 
there's a lot there to, to be thought about. What is it that, I mean, we can, we can say with quite some clarity and not a lot of ambiguity, the world is in crisis. We have major problems. We are running a mode that's not sustainable, neither ecologically nor economically nor socially. This is getting out of hand. And I can adopt a escape, escapist approach to it and say, just give me some peace of mind for a moment. And music can serve that for sure. And it's OK. But uh, I'm not content there. I would want us to push further and see how we can, in our industry, have a positive contribution to how the whole thing might turn out in a better way. Like, how could we contribute to an uh, outcome that's better than the default? And I think we stand to make a big difference, actually. I think if we just take, a, you know, take the temperature of what's going on, we're, we're trapped in a, in a destructive system of growth. Like, we need to keep making more stuff every year just to keep the economy stable. And it won't last for much longer because the Earth can't, we don't have enough planet for it. So we need a different notion of growth. I think growth is fundamentally important to people. We all want to grow, right? I mean, we want to develop. But we have to find a way to make that happen for people, many, many masses of people, in ways that don't involve material throughput in the same way. It's, that's the, it's really the, the West challenge. We have many developing countries who have to grow in a material way. They have to get out of poverty, no question. But for the West, we're saturated. We have to find ways to grow that don't involve material throughput. And I think of all the things that I can think of that point in the right direction for solving that problem, music and music making is a pretty hot candidate. Like, how do you, how do you help a person develop, flourish, you know, uh, find ways of uh, breaking through their own barriers, relating to other people in new ways, finding something in, in, within themselves that they were not aware of. Uh, I think music, you know, what's worked for me, what's worked for you, I think can work for many more people. And that's something that we as a industry are there to support. And therefore, I think we stand to make a difference. We need to commit, and we need to uh, like to walk through in our minds and uh, in our practice what that actually means, step by step. So what are we going to make? What are we going to not make? Yeah. How is, how is business, how should business look in this context? Many questions where I think our industry is interesting in that it's not quite many others. There's a lot of oddity in this industry. Like a lot of the kind of common economic rap that you get just doesn't apply. Like for 20 years now, we've all been, I have been in this waiting for the consolidation. Like, because that's what the economic textbook says, but it doesn't happen. The industry resists, it's cool. It doesn't want to be monopolized, right? because the people who make music don't want to be monopolized. We're dealing with interesting uh, aberrations of consumer behavior. We give people a thing, I mean, we sell it to them, it costs a couple hundred bucks, and they put 10,000 hours into it so that they can get really good. Where's that scene, you know? So there's some like, really fa fascinating, cool patterns to work with that somehow in exist in music. Great. I mean, that, that's a very uh, powerful call. And I, th I think many of you, that resonates with many of you. I hope there's, there's a pledge here that Gerhard is putting also to you and to the community to, uh, to, to build something um, together that's, for the music industry at least, uh, shows some uh, good example of, of behavior. And I, and I think maybe to, to be more concrete, the, um, if I understand correctly, it's about the hardware mostly and uh, how we can limit how much hardware we build and how that gets recycled, how that's 
uh, get repurposed. So, uh, and, and I know of some initiatives that Ableton has uh, in education where uh, someone buying a push two can send back their push one for it to be um, recycled in schools. Uh, I mean, I think that poses a lot of new questions for electronic music where instruments have a shelf life because they're dependent on software. Software gets upgraded and deprecated and, um, and supporting soft or hardware that depends on software for 20 years is, is, is a problem. So, uh, I mean, how do you envisage solving that uh, at Ableton? And, and how do you, would you suggest to, uh, to this community to, um, to also participate to that uh, ecological um, um, initiative? I wish I had all the answers. I mean, we are also like trapped in a kind of a bad place between, we're not a small company, but we're also not a giant. So it somehow feels like, okay, these are, these are problems that Apple types have to really solve at the core. <coughs> it's hard for us, but okay, so we try. I think one thing that we can do uh, to approach this problem is to stop thinking about our products as products and start thinking about them as musical instruments. And we come back to a lot of like, you know, the, um, the virtues that uh, have driven this whole thing forward over hundreds of years. Like make something really beautiful, something that embodies your entire like love and passion because it's, you know, will live on with the person and they will also put the love into it and it can, they will imbue it with their personality. They will find reward in investing themselves and in, in not abandoning the, the instrument like they abandon products. So I think there's something about the sheer I guess, amount of love that we can put into it. And I think there's also an uh, important, I guess, trait in, in musical instruments that's uh, got to do with make it, make it worthwhile the, the pain. I mean, music is hard. We know this. It's hard. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of endurance to become good. And I mean, you could see this yesterday. Uh, I mean, imagine Heap and Tim Exile, that's like a collected 40 years of practice. And it gets you to a place that's not like what I get when I play with Endless, right? So this is, this is what an instrument can afford if it's like, has that kind of longevity because it has the potential. Like the thing gets so much more personal, so much more expressive because you can invest yourself in, in that way. I mean, we like to think of uh, a push as something like if a person only ever bought one thing in their life and they held on to it forever, how should that thing look? And I think, of course, this is uh, a limited, it's a theoretical model, because as you say, the uh, computers around the product will vanish and software uh, will vanish and so on, so we need to take that into account. I think very importantly, think about the whole life cycle, how you could extend it as far as possible. Like if one person who got this in the first place is ready to move on for some reason, can we make sure that the thing gets a second life? Like in education, this is the program that you refer to, can we, can we give the unit to a school where you know, people will be turned on to music? Or can we make sure that uh, that uh, the unit, once it's really done and it's over, it comes back to the factory, it can be disassembled as good as we can. I mean, there's no silver bullet. It's all like these many, many small steps and we need to walk them all. Okay, well, great. I mean, I think uh, many people here will, will love to, uh, to know that that's sort of a path on which you are and that there's other ways than growth in, in the way uh, uh, growth is accepted in the economic sense. Yeah, I think it's really about thinking, it's, uh, it's almost like reversing the logic of the economic thought. It's not about how could you sell more to people, it's how can you sell less? How can you sell less product and get much more impact out of it? Like I think we need to optimize for impact. Impact as in what does this do for the person? How many people can we touch? That's, that's the thing to optimize for, not like how much product you turn around. It's not how much money you turn around, ultimately, not so important. Well, ultimately, not so important, but for the startups out there, uh, 
<laughs> getting getting to starting is, is is kind of the complexity. And so, w what's your view on on raising uh, raising funds and, and getting to that first uh, stage of growth that allow sustainability? Again, I would be happy to have like a great answer for the for the budding uh, entrepreneur at this time. I mean, for us, the story was, I think, one of government support that really made everything possible in the beginning. We started on a government grant. We also took on a venture capital and were lucky to find a way to part ways with our investors along the way. And this all went really well, and I'm, I'm very happy that we could go through this whole journey and now be in a position of independence where we can, where we are working towards a place where we can guarantee people who invest themselves in Ableton as a customer or as an employee that the company will never be sold. They will always be independent and always be following its purpose and not deviate from it for any financial uh, interest. That's like, that's a place we got to and we are so happy that we can because we still have control. But as I will say there's a lot that, uh, in, that I find in uh, our niche industry in the way of an incompatibility between how usual funding in the startup world is organized and how music works. I mean, a VC company will be looking at uh, a case on a like three to five year horizon. And within those three to five years, something has to happen that almost never happens in music because music is so slow. Like over those 20 years that I have been involved in this, there's been almost no case that would qualify for something that makes a venture capitalist happy. But now there's so much pressure because there's so much money and it wants to, you know, it wants to find a, a thing that it can, that it can leverage that this money like is also putting pressure on this industry and it wants, it wants to work. And we have to be careful because I think there could be disappointment along the way quite quickly. Music is slow. Right. So, so your, your advice uh, to, to young entrepreneurs, not necessarily young actually, any entrepreneurs starting a new business um, would be to look for bootstrapping their business and take their time. Or be ready for a journey where you know, rapid success will not come. Yes, I think this would be my advice where at all possible, take it easy and bootstrap, be uh, thrifty, you know, and small, and small steps. Where I think there's a lot to be, to be gained and learned uh, by following a slow path and to not be influenced by some of the doctrines that uh, we get pushed upon. Like I remember reading 20 years ago, a textbook on how to manage a startup that discussed the case of a company that doesn't grow in financial terms as the living dead. It's like, so you are, say you are running a business, you, you do employ a couple of people, and you have found a way to increase your impact. You reach more people, you make them even more happy every year. You just don't happen to grow financially. Now you're living, you're a zombie in that, in that uh, worldview. I find that sick. I'm very happy that I have a lot of friends in this industry who run small niche companies that don't grow and continue to add tremendous value to the, to the ecosystem. They shall be proud, they shall stand strong, and not feel like losers. Yeah. I mean, it's also, in, in this industry, maybe more than in others, there is so much place for the niches. I think this is so cool, like how many small, one person, two person, small team kinds of businesses can fit in this space? It seems like infinite. That is amazing. Yes. And so far, we have withstood uh, the tendencies 
that are always there for somebody to somehow absorb it all and you know turn it into a turnkey solution or whatever. Something we need to be uh, almost proud of, I think, as an ecosystem, we have maintained this well and need to make sure that it stays this way. No single company should have too much power, including Ableton. <laughs> I mean, that leaves Yamaha with, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a third of the entire music industry business. So is, does it qualify as too much power for you? Um, it, it somehow hasn't, it doesn't seem to be disruptive in this way. You know, I mean, it doesn't seem to take away any of the diversity that's there. So maybe not. Disruptive is another one of those. It's like the living dead. It's like the rap of you have to make something that's disruptive. Like in our industry, luckily, most things are not disruptive. It's dis so disruption is like the destruction. And so it's like this idea you have to destroy something so something new can replace it. In music, not the way it works. We rarely destroy anything. We, can, we tend to build upon stuff that's there. I mean, we're still not done with an invention that Bob Moog made in 1960-something. In fact, people go back to it. it was all, maybe it wasn't a big deal for a while. They go back and they this thing, there's still something there. We have to, we have to explore this more. Are you talking about the theremin or the... Uh... Yeah, I mean, that would go even farther back. And I mean, your point is completely correct. I mean, that's like, how's that for a legacy that still lives on? It's still like inspiring people. Awesome. So what disruption as like a concept that we tend to borrow from other industries, I don't think works here. Well, that, that touches on a, on a point that I uh, wanted to, to bring and that um, in, in Ableton's vocabulary comes very often that you consider live and, and push as instruments. And you know, the traditional sense of an instrument, of course, is you know, the, the violin and, and the piano and, and things that you can pick and play a tune with. And uh, obviously, practice has changed, and electronic music has now a 30 to 40 years history, or even more. But um, so, could, could you elaborate on, on how uh, you feel there is a new definition to happen, and not limited to push in life, but maybe many others um, that, that could also be called instruments, kind of a repertoire and learning, and et cetera? I mean, it's, it's such an important concept in the space of music, that you have to deal with it in one way or another. Like any way to think about all this stuff, it, you always touch on this at some point, and the discussion tends to get really complicated there, because of course it's a, a very leaky abstraction for all the stuff that we're doing here, but also very interesting and powerful, I think, to spark a good debate. I think of the kinds of products that we make as uh, instruments, However, in a uh, not quite traditional sense, like a traditional instrument, for one, is a proposition that lives in the here and now, like you have to be there when it's being played to hear it. And it also typically is an uh, element amongst others, where the kinds of instruments that we're dealing with here, uh, like the output is not only real time, the output is a song, it's finished, you can listen to it. And the scope of the instrument is everything that's in the song, like whatever parts or uh, whatever components it consists of. So still I find the notion of these is instruments powerful because we share a lot of the properties, like it's rewarding to invest yourself, it's never gonna be easy, there's no, uh, no mistake to be made here, it's not a convenience a thing like product thinking doesn't apply. Uh, there's idiosyncrasy, like in most instruments, highly idiosyncratic. You are building on layers and layers of legacy over time, some good, some bad. And in that sense, it is a lot like an instrument for sure. Also, I think a whole, uh, maybe a term that uh, needs modification for these purposes, maybe these are meta instruments. And there's more, I mean, we're not, 
for, for sure not the only people making them. The concept of the instrument and applying it to like a piece of software was, int was important to us from the beginning because we just had like this sort of more jamming, improvisational approach to music making. We could not deal with a timeline because I guess it's not how we thought about music. And it therefore came naturally to us to think of like, you know, how might we make a piece of software that lets you make a piece of music and you don't ever have to think of the timeline in the beginning. So the idea that you can on the spot decide what happens next was important and I think that also got us to call Ableton Live a sequencing instrument. It's on the box of the first version. There is this, um, this article by Brian Eno from, from the 90s, I think, where um, he sort of reflects on his, his um, relationship with instruments and software and, and synthesizers and, and contrasts like the world of, of options where mm -hmm. you have, in software in particular, a lot of menus and things to choose from with uh, a much more limited range of possibilities in, in physical instruments with much more depth. And he, he calls that the intimacy and that's where you know, traditionally musicians have been um, spending their 10,000 hours it's in the intimacy world. And I think with maybe what you call a meta instrument, you have like this new sort of things bridging, bridging the gap. Uh, so do you think you're offering sort of intimacy and option at the same time? I think there's a, to some level that's mutually exclusive. I think he has a point there. Also, it's hard to think of like, for example, how concepts like repertoire could come into play when you're making meta instruments. Like, you know, I'm recomposing a song that doesn't make sense because the output of the instrument that you play is a song. So I think there's a whole separate thread to follow and so much more work to be done and so much fascinating, interesting work within electronic music and electronic instruments on like a more traditional instrument side. Like, you know, theremine and whatever comes after. This is, this is still, I think, still wide open. A lot more to be done. What we make, I think, and you know, many other, few other companies in this space in the way of meta instruments, I think it's a clearly different thing. It's, it's also a lot about compromise. It's like the art of compromise, like a push uh, aims to make everything possible for you with a very limited real estate and a very, I guess, um, focused physical interface. And it should do all of these things. And it's like, how, how can you get all of this into that limited, uh, dimension, and that's a it's a whole different ball game. I feel, but I'm on the other side. I am looking forward to seeing more like real, actual instruments in a traditional sense that are somehow new. Right, right. So, just uh, keeping an eye on the time and wanting to also let you at some point ask ask your question. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask uh, from you is having been here for the past two days and seeing what people are up to and um, what, what, what's, what's your takeaway from, uh, from the conference? I mean, for one, it's a, I always enjoy the, this company and I think it's a wonderful event. I, apart from the general vibe and the like, positiveness of it, uh, I mean, I was impressed with yesterday's performance. You know? it's, it's just uh, cool to see how like this put the 10,000 hours in and there will be a reward, how that holds in our space, just like, you know, 100 years ago. And I think also how in the case of uh, both Imagine Heaps and Tim Axel's work, somehow they have arrived at a state where it's not so much a uh, novelty. Any, like my sensation of it isn't like this is about a new technology or something. It, quickly fades away and you're left with what is this person actually trying to express and it helps if you have like a beautiful voice and you can sing really well, it's also true. <laughs> I think that was, uh, that was a wonderful event. I also really enjoyed the, um, the keynote, this, Francois uh, keynote this morning. I couldn't see all of the day so I missed a lot unfortunately but it was also highly inspiring of course.
So yeah, that's the stuff to think about. Good. Would you imagine um, a world where people could in live rehash some of the past music in, in the way that Francois did show this morning? It was possible to do. Um, and do you think that has the potential to inspire composers and, and producers, or do you think it will scare them thinking, well, I don't want machines to tell me yeah. how to make music? I mean, this is such an incredibly sensitive space of, uh, like, you're dealing with fundamental questions of, like, artistic identity and what kinds of feelings people bring to, like, these meta instruments. And it, this has to be managed with great care, I think. Um, I, I'm totally with Francois that what we need here now is art. We need artists to work with the stuff because always it's the artists that show the way ultimately. Somebody's got to be blazing the trail. And maybe at some point, it will take time. It will find its way into these products in a way that is cool and not somehow at odds with how we are like to think about ourselves as creative people. It's a, it's a touchy area. It is, yes. Um, but something else that, that uh, of, of significance uh, happened in the past two days is that you know, the, the specifications of MIDI 2.0 were um, explained in, for the first time in, in some details. And that's significant because MIDI has <laughs> has been the same and it was part of its strength uh, to allow devices, software to communicate. So um, are there anything in particular that you're looking forward to in, in, in MIDI 2? Uh? Well, I mean, this would maybe be a good time to give a high five to your own work and the work at Roly that happened around MP. I think it's, oh. this is a, you people really moved something that hasn't been moving for what, the better part of 30 years, right? towards a, a place where we like, are all now facing you know, a, dip, a new dimension of expression. And it's important. It's really important work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, one thing that I could imagine it could um, impact, in, in a way in which it could impact Ableton is, you know, and in the spirit of openness that you, you've showed as well today, uh, that that ecology and that repurposing of instruments in in, a, in an interconnected world, that you know, one manifestation in which you know, push could also control other software and and other hardware could also um, be more interconnected. So is, is that something that you keep an eye on, like other companies with which to partner? I know there's Link, for example. <coughs> Sorry, which connects uh, Ableton to other devices, but um, what, what's, what's your perspective on, on connecting and working in partnership with? Um, yeah, I mean, as you say, we've like, uh, tried to make a contribution to the space with Link. The idea, very similarly, was uh, let's solve a very basic problem that, like, I mean, if you ever tried to make electronic music together with a couple of people and with computers, it's a complete nightmare. And this kind of makes it all go away and it's transparent. So it was more a move towards, um, yeah, I guess contributing to all of this making more sense more seamlessly. It's generally, uh, it's a tough one because, I mean, as you have also experienced uh, at Roly, it's uh, difficult to, you can easily overstretch the boundary of what's generic and what has to become special. Like in, in MPE context, for example, it's not as simple as like, here's your controller, here's the 3D data that it sends, and it will now work with every instrument that also supports the protocol in any meaningful way. This is, uh, it's, not, it's not a viable theory. So there's a lot of hand tweaking on both ends, I feel. So this, very powerful general concepts that connect everything together, like MIDI and like Link, are also for a reason somewhat generic in the scope and what they try to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So it's tricky. Like if you feel there's a lot of value you can bring by 
very well adjusting and attuning to each other all the components, the software, the hardware, the, you know, how, how you teach stuff. There's a lot of value in it, and of course, that's a little bit the, the, the business we are in. Yeah, of course. So, so it's a complicated answer because it's a complicated reality for us. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, great. Well, um, I would like to open the, uh, the questions to, to the floor. I think we have a microphone uh, that we can circulate and take questions. So do we have questions for Gerhard, uh, for Ableton in general? Can I have a first question somewhere? I'm happy to continue asking questions. We have one here and one there. Could someone bring a mic to them? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so in the beginning, you were talking about the evolution of Ableton. It's here, over here. <laughs> um, uh, and what I would like to know is, so you went from a relatively small sized uh, startup in the late 90s to uh, a company that employs several hundreds of people now. Um, my question is how did you, how was your evolution from being an executor as in being a developer to, um, well, well becoming, well becoming a boss, <laughs> um, not in the negative sense, but more as in how do you maintain leadership and how do you maintain uh, vision and sort of promotes uh, inventorship in a way in your company and what helped you along the way with this evolution? Long question, sorry. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm struggling to find a punchy answer to it. Um, I mean, I mean, I described in the beginning the evolution of the company as like this, like the motion is zooming out. And of course, the same thing happened for me personally too, very much so. And I think the kinds of struggles that happen along the way is like the zooming out has to be faster than you can kind of like, I mean, I'm also like of modest intellectual capacity. So it's, and you're always at the absolute limits of what you can still deal with in terms of complexity. So that's there for sure. How can you somehow stay ahead of this curve? And you can't. So you're often like uh, behind and catching up. And then at some point you feel again, okay, now I'm seeing the, uh, now I'm seeing the sky again and I need to, it's my role. I think that's, that's there. And this otherwise just like a tremendous reliance on amazing people and I think this was a blessing that I have enjoyed from day one. I have always worked with people who in their individual capacities were so amazing and so like reliable that a lot of this worry about the like things that you leave behind as you zoom out are not there. And you know, like this is taken care of, this is solid and, and it's cool. And, I think I still tend to sometimes zoom too far back in. I think some of that is good. Like you need to be touching base back with like, in my case, what's that button do exactly and why? And can we talk about it? And this can be very disruptive to the, uh, to the organization. Like it can also be like alienating for uh, the colleagues, I'm sorry. I was apologize with uh, colleagues who are here who have uh, endured this sometimes. <laughs> but um, it is a reflex and sometimes um, it comes through. And I mean, then you have great help from your colleagues who give you advice and sometimes on a really good day also critical feedback. So you learn that way. I don't have a, I don't have a really good like recipe for it. I think the one thing that I've, I've found consistently, like the one thing I always come back to is, like you will face so many problems and so many like people in pain of all sorts and you can completely absorb in that. And it's so important to always manage to step back and say, why are we here? What are we here to do? 
and keep that on the agenda somehow. It's so easy to get lost in like uh, some you know, trouble of how do we organize this and whatever, or technical problems or something. And often when we manage to step back and say, why did we come to all of this and approach it from a, as wide an angle as we can, some of it goes away because we find back meaning and we find back motivation and we solve the problem and we move on. So that's, I found often, uh, that's maybe a recipe. Thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned learning a couple of times tonight. Um, and in recent years, Ableton have been producing some really um, fantastic web resources. I have to commend the web team on, on that because they're really, really cool. How can we, as an industry that keeps making more and more complicated things, help people learn and begin with, uh, with the things we're making? Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a lot to be invented still. I mean, the people who make the uh, interactive uh, websites that you talk about in some way are researchers also. I think it's not like there's a pattern, now you reiterate. I think it's a lot of finding a way and seeing what works, seeing what sticks. There's like a ridiculous amount of testing that goes into this stuff, always with like amazing surprises about what works and what doesn't. And it's really difficult to, because of the curse of knowledge, it's really difficult to imagine even how things might not be self-evident. Like a, this, this classic case of, like you show a step sequencer interface, like 808 type, and you have a person with like major academic accomplishment, like they have their PhD uh, under their belts, and they, have, they cannot figure it out. Like, ah, it's like as it goes through, I hear the sounds while I put the, you know, while uh, turned on the buttons. It's amazing, like how some things don't somehow naturally click, and this is only, the team only finds this out by trying, I guess. So I think that's one area. It's like merciless trying, trial and error, and trying it again. And I think then the, uh, the, the meta story about that is what's facilitated learning, like classroom learning, how, how might that look in future? I think there's, that's a whole different arena and one that we deal with a lot and have great, great interest and think there's so much leverage there, but also so much to be figured out and to be invented. It's so always been, uh, as I said, very lucky for us to be close to teachers and educational institutions, and also to people who are in their own way researchers in the field, like a t teachers who have tried it out because they are frustrated with the fact that they can't reach most of the kids in the class anymore. It's like if they haven't already learned to play the violin age eight, by the time they get a hold of them when they're 12, there's nothing they can do for them. Now, that, that's just not cool. So they try to invent something else. Try to invent ways how they can teach them to make music that they actually like to listen to, like that's closer to what they naturally want to hear. And I think that's something that we, we need to support. And like a lot of good to be done there. So this is something we very much stand behind. And if you have an, uh, if you don't know what Tom has been as, uh, asking about, it's uh, the website is learningsins.ableton.com, where Ableton has put um, a way of learning about synthesizers uh, and all functioning in the website. So do we have uh, another question? We have one here, and uh, we have time also for another one. So okay, so probably here. <coughs> So I'm one of those small bootstrapping uh, entrepreneurs that you were talking about before. I'm Good. putting out my first plugin, uh, doing it part-time because I have to make a living, have a family. Um, and what you said about um, uh, bootstrapping and taking it slow, that really resonated with me. Uh, but I'm also finding it uh, <laughs> very difficult, and I guess that's what you also talked about, always being two steps behind, because when you put yourself in that situation, 
Uh, obviously, you, you need to make a good product, otherwise you'll never be successful. But there's so many other things you need to do as well, right? You need to, to talk to users, you need to get feedback, you need to think about marketing and, and how do you take payments and, uh, you know, how do you, do you have any advice on how to navigate through that, how not to lose your way in, in all these uh, concerns that you have to address? Mm. I mean, from, I think, a like, psychological point of view, it probably is always helpful to not be alone. Like, I could not have, for the life of me, done any of this alone, not only because of competency, but also because of, I guess, camar missing camaraderie. I don't want to be alone doing my thing. It wouldn't work for me. So that's one, like, sh some more shoulders. And, of course, I mean, then the idea that bootstrapping is a possibility is also, of course, not always there. It's not always viable. And, and there's nothing wrong with investment and finding, finding people who believe in it and put themselves behind it. I think it's also a, a pity that I wouldn't have a great suggestion for how like, funding might look in this industry that is somehow more... Uh, fits better its dynamic. I would love to point at uh, places to go. I think so far, mostly what seems to work for people is like uh, business angels, like private people who have somewhere else and are somehow inspired by this and really getting behind it. But of course, there's only so many and then it's like, how do you get to them? It's, but then it's there's not a really pretty solution to it. I think there's something missing. But finding investors is also work, right? It's, of course, yes. I mean, managing investor expectations and following up. Uh, it, it doesn't take work off the table, at least. No, I think what most people who've been through this can testify about is like at some point, the role of one of the people in the founding team is very much focused on that. Dealing, it was like this in our case, it was also okay and planned. I mean, we took we found Jan to do it. So I was like, he's a financial guy. It's not a musician. It's what he wants to do. It was his great at. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. And, but it's also a reality then that really is what, where the time goes. Like the person is busy with dealing with investors. Yeah. So we have time for one last question. I think uh, Pervi over here. You can get the microphone to her. Over here. And I'm sorry, everyone else, this, this will be the last question. So coming back to what you said about growth and how every company doesn't have to be high growth, uh, what does that look like internally at Ableton? What kind of a framework does the team work in? Um, are there goals? Are there quarterly goals, annual goals, or no goals? Or is it just iterative? Like, how does it work? I hear some laughs, and there must be from <laughs> people who work there. <laughs> so, um, I, I can't say there's not like a, a simple system of quarterly goals that are like broken down in numbers or something. We are not very KPI driven, but of course, like you have people in in, in uh, commercial functions who set themselves goals. Of course, they want to know how they're doing and they, uh, they need that. But in general and overall, the company is, is not driven by financial goals. It, uh, finance, usually finan financials work backwards. Like there's an idea of what we want to do and what we want to accomplish. And then we try to work the business around it. And sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But it's also, in our case, very difficult to come up with like a consistent uh, way to measure what's happening because the psychology is just so complicated. Like we do stuff like put on a conference every year. That's like very high fidelity, lots, lots of attendance. It's Loop, a summit for music makers. I can tell you that it's not making a profit at all. And Still, I think it probably 
has some positive contribution to the overall Ableton business somewhere very indirectly, but nobody knows this. Nobody has a way to really validate that story and we kind of believe in it anyway. So there's a lot of belief in the whole thing and we could always be wrong. Great, well, uh, it's been an honor to, uh, to interview you, Gerard, tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>